Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. In this video, we're gonna talk about opioids and opiates. So first, let's define the two. Opioids are gonna be any naturally occurring or synthetic compound that binds to opioid receptors inside the body. Now there's three opioid receptors. There's mu, delta, and kappa. And when you bind to them and activate them, you're gonna result, it's gonna result in analgesia, which is pain relief. So that's an opioid. Now an opiate is gonna be a chemical compound that's isolated or extracted from the poppy plant. So this includes morphine, heroin, codeine, for example. So they're all opiates, and they also bind to these opioid receptors. So opioids, and underneath opioids, we have opiates specifically from the poppy plant. Now, when we look at these three receptors that opioids bind to, mu, delta, and kappa, we've got them up here, mu, delta, kappa, you can see the various symbols that denote each receptor. What you'll find is that the specific endogenous, that means coming from within, endogenous chemicals that we release that binds to these specific receptors. So for example, if we want to bind to and activate mu receptors, we release endorphins. If we want to bind to and activate delta receptors, we, re we release enkephalins. And if we want to do the same for kappa, we release dynorphins. They're the endogenous, the ones that we make inside of our body for endogenous pain relief. And I spoke about that in a previous video. Now there's also chemicals that we can put into our body exogenously from the outside. And that can come from a plant, that can come from another animal, or that can be made within a lab. So for example, we've got morphine and fentanyl. Both morphine and fentanyl bind more or less specifically to mu receptors. And I'll tell you what that means in a second, that's what's clinically relevant about that. We've got deltorphin, which binds to delta. And we've got two, now deltorphin doesn't come from within. We don't really use it as a drug. It's an extract from frogs, okay? But we know that it binds specifically to the delta receptors. And we've also got Bup sorry, buprenorphine and pentazacine, and both of these are agonists for the kappa receptor. So here's another important point. You've got agonists which activate these receptors to have their analgesic and other effects, but you're also gonna have compounds that bind to the receptors to antagonize it and stop or negate those effects. And what you can see is there's one particular drug that we can use that does this for every single receptor. And this is naloxone. Now naloxone can be used when somebody is overdosing, for example, on heroin or morphine or fentanyl. And what it will do is put it into an individual, it will competitively bind to the receptor and push these chemicals or these drugs off the opioid receptors and binds to it itself basically negating the detrimental effects that can happen from overdosing for these drugs. So that's naloxone. Now, let's have a look at what happens if you stimulate the mu receptor specifically. Let's just say you're giving somebody the gold standard morphine. All right, well, analgesia is the primary goal when we use these drugs, all right? So you can have supraspinal analgesia, that's above the spine. So we're talking about brain, basically, and we've got spinal analgesia. So these are gonna be the two primary areas that we want analgesia to occur, so pain relief to occur. Because remember this, pain is entirely perceptual. Pain is all in the brain. Now, this is not to be derogatory for people with chronic pain, saying it's all in your head. What I'm saying is that pain is 100% at the level of perception. If you change perception, you can change pain. Remember that. All right. So when we look at mu receptor, if you stimulate it and activate it, it has supraspinal analgesia. So it alters your perception of pain and also central processing in the brain and spinal analgesia, which means it stops the signal going from the spine up to the brain. That's how these mu receptors work. For example, that of morphine. But you'll see that something that's really important clinically is ventilatory depression. This is basically stopping or reducing an individual's ability to breathe. Mu receptors seem to be quite specific for ventilatory depression, which means when you give somebody morphine at the same time that you're giving them analgesic effects, you're also depressing the ventilation. As you increase the dosage, more analgesia and more ventil ventilatory depression. This is one of the main reasons or how an individual who is taking morphine can die is they simply stop breathing. How does this happen? Because it inhibits neurons firing off in the medulla. Okay, the medulla is the breathing center of the brain. GIT effects. So you need to remember that 
when you activate some of these receptors like mu receptors and kappa receptors that it stops the smooth muscle from working now smooth muscle lines the hollow insides of certain organs and it contracts and relaxes in the gastrointestinal tract contracting and relaxing helps push things through it's called peristalsis now if somebody has something called a paralytic ileus it means that it's just not working at all shouldn't be taking morphine for example because what this does is it stops this smooth muscle from working properly things stop moving constipation can happen from morphine for example all right and that's the GIT effects but also some effects can happen with the urinary system so if somebody has urinary retention morphine probably isn't going to be that good for it because it stops the smooth muscle from doing its effects pushing things through and the last one is sedation so you can see that if you have enough morphine you can sedate the individual as well you can even promote that individual from going into a sleep state because of its sedative effect and you can see that the others have varying capacities to hit the analgesic effects, the ventilatory effects, GIT effects, and sedation effects. How, when we stimulate these receptors, how do they elicit their effect? What happens? Well, if we've got a neuron, remember a neuron wants to send a signal ultimately to the brain. It's gonna go from, let's just say I stub my toe, I kick my foot, stub the toe, needs to go from my toe to my brain. And the way it does this is it travels through a three neuron chain from my foot to my brain. It's a three neuron chain from my hand to my brain. Okay, it doesn't matter. Pain pathway is three neurons. Let's have a look. It starts at the foot. One neuron goes into the spinal cord and synapses, which means it speaks to the second neuron. That's at the spinal cord as soon as it enters. This second neuron goes to the other side and goes up past the brainstem goes to the thalamus, which is the sorting center. It reads that signal, sends it to another neuron and throws it to the cortex where we make sense of the pain. So if you want to alter pain, you can do it in one, two, three, four different places, all right? At the site in which you stimulated it, in the spinal cord, at the thalamus or at the cortex of the brain. So cortex of the brain is going to be the perception, the, per the perception changes that are occurring. Now, you can also have these afferents that are firing off from the pain signal at the brain stem, and this is going to go to the reticular system to make you awake. It's going to go to the amygdala to make you em emotional as well. And it's also going to go to other varying places such as the basal ganglia and so forth. Now, where do opioids work? Well, opioids work predominantly in the central nervous system. They don't have a very good effect at my foot where the pain started, but has a great effect in the central nervous system, spinal cord, brainstem, and cortex as well, including the thalamus. Now, how does it work? So, all opioid receptors are seven channel pass receptors that are coupled to a G protein. What does that mean? Simply means the receptor goes through the membrane seven times and on the inside of the neuron or inside of the cell, it's bound to a protein that it activates. So let's just say this is a mu receptor, this one here. We've thrown endorphins at it, it binds to it, stimulates this seven pass channel. It then stimulates the G protein. G protein is a molecular switch, flick it, turns on, what's it gonna do? It will travel to calcium channels and stop calcium channels from sending calcium inside the cell. Why is this important? Well, anytime a neuron becomes positive inside the neuron, it sends a signal. If you stop it from becoming positive, it stops sending the signal. So if we stop calcium coming in, it stops it from becoming positive. This is called hyperpolarization, stops neuronal excitability, perfect. But there's another way we can do this. G pro protein can activate potassium channels and potassium channels want to throw potassium out of the cell. That's positive. So if you're throwing positive things out, it becomes negative inside, again, hyperpolarizing the cell, stopping the signal from being sent. This is how predominantly, there's other different ways, but this is how opioids and opioid receptors exert their effects in the central nervous system. However, at the cortex, where we have a different perception of pain, the way that it modulates pain here is by altering our perception. So if somebody comes in with a 10 out of 10 pain and then you give them morphine and ask them, are you still feeling the pain? The pain doesn't go away. They say, yeah, I still feel the pain, I just don't care. And that's how it modulates the perception of pain. So this is opioids and opiates.